Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Hartley United Methodist Church Sanctuary. Whether you're in here in the room in person or at home, we're really glad you're here. Um, if you were watching the countdown screen, it was not the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Somehow that got left over from a previous week. And uh, those who were watching the countdown at home probably were wondering what was going on, seeing a loaf of bread and a description of a road. But anyway, this is the Sunday that we do God moments, a short testimony. If you may so be thinking about how God has provided or helped you recently, you could share that briefly when that time comes during prayer. We do have prayer cards that are in the pew or in the pad, a few pads. If you'll need a, to want to share a request, you can fill that out and hand it directly to the ushers when they collect the offering in a few minutes. On September 10th, at 9 o'clock, the trustees would like all of us who are able to meet at the parsonage to help do some needed outdoor brush work and other, and they're going to do some power washing and things like that. And if enough sign up, there will be some projects that will be done at, here at the church as well. If, and we might even combine that with the clean up the basement no, announcement as well. I'm not sure what they're going to do yet with that. Um, there will be a sign up sheet for that next week. Please join each other at the other end of the building for an indoor picnic. The rain didn't cooperate like I ordered last week, so we'll, but we'll have a good time indoors as, with each other as well. Uh, if you didn't happen to bring anything, don't worry about it. I'm sure there'll be plenty to share, so we're, we're in good shape. Uh, a special thanks who made all of that possible. Uh, Karen and Donna spearheaded the picnic, and uh, there's others who always we all brought things to share. So we appreciate all of you doing that. Thanks to Jim Cleveland in the tech booth. Uh, Donna Ullman and Kathy Novak are on the instruments, and they'll be offering uh, some special music later in the service as well. Our ushers are Jeff Gordonier and Jerry Weaver, and our lay reader is Pat Coleman, who will now guide you in reciting the Apostles' Creed on the yellow font while I give the prompting questions in the white. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is at the right hand of God, the Almighty God, from thence he will come to judge the Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Our money verse today comes from Psalm 132, 13 and following, where God promises his presence and provision to King David. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem as his home, saying, This is my resting place forever. I will live here because I so much want to do too. I will shower blessings on my people and satisfy their poor with their fill of food. I will clothe the priest with salvation and their faithful with joy. Without going into a lot of detail, some see Jerusalem not only as the physical city, but also as a metaphor for all places where God is elevated to his proper place in the universe. We give him thanks for all of God's promises to us, and especially through Jesus Christ. Remember to give your filled out prayer cards directly to the ushers as we now collect the morning offering.
Our Heavenly Father, we faithfully give these gifts with gratitude as one way of praising you for what you have done and with a confident hope of what you will do. For we remember how you faithfully fed your people in the wilderness in the days of Moses and the crowds by the sea in the days of Jesus. As we worship, we ask you, Lord, the bread of life, to nourish our souls today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing for the call to worship in the first song. So let's enter the presence of our God and worship by recognizing his holiness by singing holy, holy, holy. Here I am. Who is it? Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to demand that he let you lead my people out of Egypt. But why me? Who am I? I'm not the person for a job like that. I will be with you, and this will be the proof that I am the one who is sending you. 
when you have led the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. If I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your fathers sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Who are you talking about? What do I tell them? I am who I am. Tell the people of Israel, I am has sent me. Tell them Jehovah, the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and, Joseph, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This has always been my name, and this is how I will always be known. This is the name you shall call me throughout all generations. We're beginning a new series on the I Am statements of Jesus. But what we just heard is real, where it really started when God approached Moses in a routine moment of everyday life to call him to a mission to which he was well suited. But Moses was skeptical about that suiting, and so he questions his own worth. But God replies by saying, I'll be with you. It's not our ability, but our availability that God seeks. Moses needed to learn to not rely on his natural strengths, but on the preparation and gifts that God would give and gift to him. As Paul says in the New Testament, when I am weak, then I am strong because it is God's grace and power that works through me. And that is, through Christ we can do all things. But in the light of being called to a mission in impossible times, freeing people that were enslaved by a powerful empire isn't exactly a simple task. Moses was honest. He wondered if God would be enough. So he asked in a very tactful way by saying, well, what if they tell me who you are? Who do I say? Actually, what he was saying, who are you, God? And his answer was, I am will always be my name. It's not very translatable into English, but the essence of it is, you can trust me to be who I am, and I will always be there with just what you need. I am the same God you've always known, who has never let anyone down. The same God, the same covenant, but now doing a brand new thing. When Jesus came to earth, he picked up on the same statements. The front of the bulletin captures that sentiment. Jesus says, Abraham, look forward to the day I'd be here. And when that was met with disbelief, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus issues several more I am statements and elaborates with a more specific qualifier depending on the context in which he utters the phrase. But it always resounds back to this overarching I am. I will be here for you. I am what you need for me, for you. From the foundations of the world, he has always been, is, and will always be the great I am who is present for everything we truly need. So let's sing together, O oh God, our help in ages past.
When God comes to us to be what we need and calls us to be the answer to others' needs, we find we are in a holy place. Because wherever God's presence is, is a holy place, because he is holy. Since he promises to be with us when we worship him, we are in a holy place now. So let's prepare our hearts for God moments and for prayer by singing Holy Ground. Now is your opportunity to share how God has been your help, how you've experienced him recently. Just raise your hand and if you're comfortable, stand as I come to you. And I wait till somebody says something. Okay. Well, I hate to admit this, but this month, Two times I lost something very important. <laughs> the first time it was my passport and I needed it really bad. And so I called or I sent a text to the prayer group on Wednesday and I had looked for it for two days already. And so on Wednesday, they prayed Wednesday morning that God would direct me to find the passport. And so that day after I got home, I found my passport and I said, thank you, God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And then uh, I had to go have a tooth pulled and they said, we need your driver's license and we need your medical card. And I looked in my wallet and it was gone. I didn't want to call the prayer group again. I didn't want them to think I was crazy. <laughs> so uh, I called my brother and my autistic nephew. And sometimes when my autistic nephew prays, things happen. And uh, my brother said, Calvin, tell Aunt Janice what the uh, devotion was this morning. And he said, Jesus loves me. And, I, and my brother said, well, what else did the devotion say? And it said, seek and you shall find. <laughs> And so later that day, I went seeking, and I found what I needed. So, and I was able to have my tooth pulled. <laughs> Very good. Jesus came to help seek, find the lost. I saw no. Oh, right. Okay. That uh, story reminds me that I got myself a new pair of glasses last week. Two days later, I lost them. I searched all over the house. I couldn't find them anywhere. 
until I went to take a shower and they were in my bathrobe. <laughs> Three days later, I lost my glasses again. Luckily, I made a phone call to Myers, and Myers had my glasses for me. Otherwise, I searched all over again. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you. I thought I saw a hand over on this side. Okay, Vivian. Again, I want to thank you all for praying for our son, Danny. He's doing very well. Um, continued prayers, please, because now he's on a heart transplant and a kidney uh, list. He's doing well. Um, but he needs help. God has been with us for the whole trip, this whole year or so. And uh, he is faithful. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Go ahead. I was going for a walk a couple weeks ago, and I, I had talked to Linda the previous Sunday, and I was going for my walk, listening to my Christian music, and uh, she had me pick out a prayer quilt for my niece, Lauren. And I goes, wow, you know, it'd be nice if I could... Uh, let the family know when they're going to dedicate this quilt, you know. So I goes, oh, well, whenever that happens, you know, I'll do that. Then the next day, there was a chair situation at church. I came up here, and I had to call the pastor. And he goes, well, what's your, uh, he told me about the chairs, but he, he said, what's your uh, niece's last name? And I told him Weaver. And he goes, yeah, we're going to be doing that this Sunday. And I was like, oh, so God's calling me out quick. <laughs> you know, so then I uh, made some phone calls to my family, and I was able to uh, get people from uh, her boyfriend lives in Milan, and some of my family lives in Davison and Flint, and they all came the next Sunday, and we had about 16 people from my family here. And Lauren was here with her son, and it was a great moment for my family, so... Sometimes God calls you quick to do stuff, and uh, I was just available, and it was, and it made it happen. So, it made me feel really, really good. So, thanks to all of you for being here and sharing it with me. That was a blessing for us to have all of you here. Yes, it was. Uh, decide which way to run here. <laughs> Hi, this is um, about my husband. He does not go to the doctors, and he hasn't been in probably 25, 30 years. And I go every three months. And so he had some surgery done on Monday, did well. He had a little bit of surgery done on Thursday, did great. And I'm like, okay, just wait till you get your blood pressure um, medicine. And well, they found out he had high blood pressure, so he takes one pill. And so I said, wait till your blood work comes back. And it came back above normal and perfect. Now, <laughs> not one thing is wrong. He's doing great. He just has to bring down his cholesterol 29 points. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but praise God, because he hasn't been in so long. I'm so thankful. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Let me see if I can get us. Yeah, there we are. All right, well, my uh, daughter Katie and her husband Kevin have been married, well, will be married seven years next month. They're good Christian people, and they've been trying ever since they've been married to have a baby. That's something they really wanted more than anything else. And uh, uh, unfortunately, Katie's had several miscarriages, and it greatly tested their faith, and we have been praying for them, you know, all the time. And so finally, last November, Katie said she was pregnant again, and then, you know, that required more prayers. It's like, God, please let this, let this child come. And so she's, she was carrying the baby, and we had her shower in June. Uh, that went very well, and right up until a week from her due date, the doctor said that she had low amniotic fluid levels. So, uh, 
you know, obviously that then she had to rush right into the hospital to do. Uh, they had to they had to in, try to induce her, and this was a Friday night, and my wife was just distraught. And but, you know, we'd been through so much, and I just had faith that everything was going to be all right. And my wife was thinking of the worst possible scenarios, that she'd have a C-section, that the baby would have all these events, this would go wrong, that would go wrong. Well, the next day, Saturday, we were coming back from the farm market, and she got all, she's like, oh, you got to stop the car. Stop. And so, like, I pulled over on a side road, and I thought maybe it was bad news. I couldn't believe it would be, but she says, oh, she said, Katie had the baby at 11 this morning. Kevin had texted us a couple hours later, and she had had it naturally, no C-section or anything, and it was a quick, the, the doctors were amazed at how fast she, she gave birth. They'd never seen an induced labor on a first pregnancy come through that fine. He's a perfectly healthy seven pound, 11 ounce boy, and it's a wonderful blessing. I just wanted to thank God for that and just let everyone know, and he's the answer to a prayer, so many prayers. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you. All right. No, it, it just happened um, as I was reading the Bible verses for the theme today, um, and it is, you know, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, and persecutions. My students last semester were fairly unprofessional and horrible, and in my evaluation said incredibly hurtful and mean things, and I really wasn't looking forward to going back to a new group this semester, and when I'm reading this, I'm like, okay, I might need to print it up really big and remember that I can delight in insults and persecutions um, because God can help me through it. So I texted it to my teaching partner, so hopefully we'll have a better semester with a new attitude. <laughs> Thank you. Good times and bad, he's always there, isn't he? Anybody else? All right. We haven't done this for quite a while, um, the relaxing thing. So get yourself into a comfortable posture where you're nice and relaxed. If your hands are clenched, unclench them. Breathe slowly and deeply. Exhale the busyness of the week. Inhale the quiet peace of the moment. Exhale the stress. Inhale compassionate understanding. Exhale the pains and struggles. Inhale his healing. Settle your hearts into silence while Don and Kathy play softly. Come away with me. Lord, we're thankful for what we've just heard. Not only in the music, your desire to get away, ask us to come away with you in a quiet time and just be with you and sense your presence. But we thank you also for what we've heard in testimonies, how you've been working in the lives of your people in this church. We are so grateful from the small things to the big. And even small things to us can be really big things. 
makes or breaks our day sometimes, and we're just thankful for the way you just watch over us. We turn to you to light our way, and as we do that, fear dissipates. When we seek your joy, you become our strength. When we are tempted and evil advances against us, you faithfully hold us and keep us from falling. We seek your beauty today. We recognize in you that you are abundantly more than we need. So we lift up our needs and the needs of those surrounding us in the community, in the nation, in the world, whatever you have placed on our hearts. <clears throat> Specifically today, we play, pray for uh, a request from Sherry for Joyce, who's recovering from surgery. And we also pray for Fran Worthman, who it is confirmed she had a stroke and is now in a rehab center. And we just pray for a complete recovery for her. We continue to pray for Ann Martin and Bill Wyckoff, both recovering from surgery. For the Heathcock family, dealing with a father with cancer and a loss of a car. For Valerie Carpenter, who needs a new heart. Lord, there's so many requests on our hearts and minds. Now, according to your patient timing, we ask you to intervene and bring your kingdom values to us in your, and to your earth, just as they are in heaven, just as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus traveled among the villages teaching and healing. He gave authority and instructions for the disciples and sent them out to do the same. They did, they did news, they did. News came to them about the horrific death of John the Baptist and they gathered to lay his body to rest. The disciples told Jesus about their exciting but exhausting experiences. But so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have time for a leisurely meal. Jesus told his disciples to come with them to a quiet place to rest a while. They took a boat to a deserted place, but people saw where they were headed and rushed on foot to arrive ahead of them. Jesus saw the crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Late in the day, his disciples came to him. They interrupted, this is a remote place and it's already very late. Pronounce a benediction and send the people away so that they can go to the nearby villages and farms and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you feed them. They replied, with what? It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy food for this crowd. How much food do we have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Jesus directed all the people to sit down in groups of 50 or 100. They looked like a patchwork quilt of wildflowers spread out on the green grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven in prayer, he gave thanks for the food, blessed, broke, and gave it to his disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate until they were satisfied. The disciples gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. More than 5,000 were at the supper. Immediately after the meal was finished, Jesus insisted his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida, where he would join them later. He would stay and dismiss the crowd. After sending them off, he went up on the mountainside to pray. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was the desperate cries of the people enslaved in Egypt that brought God to Moses, and it was the desperate urgency of oppressed people that brought them out to hear Jesus speak that day. 
It was the same kind of desperation that inspired James Rowe to write the words of Love Lifted Me. I grew up singing this hymn, but just to remind myself and you of some of those lyrics. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling, in his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful loving service too to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Now listen to Don and Kathy play it as you think about how God's love has lifted you. So like the people who came out to see him that day, got fed by his teaching and also by the food that he provided, let's also seek the Lord and allow him to feed us too, that we might find freedom and peace. 
Let's stand and stretch before the sermon and sing, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, be on the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit pants for thee, O living bird. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou didst bless the I was instructed, because some of the food is coming late, to stretch this, ser- this service out as long as I possibly can, and I see we're in good shape to do that. <laughs> this is an unusual sermon. It's the only one that I do like this. I'm not a dramatist, so I'm not go- so I'm going to have to ask you to stretch your imaginations a little harder than if one of our good dramatists like Mary Jo or Charles was up here doing this. But try to put yourself into the shoes of, now if, if I had it in my inventory, I would be wearing carpenter's pants with a hammer and maybe a saw. But I don't have that in my, I have the saw and hammer, but I didn't bring them, but I don't have the carpenter's pants anymore right now. And flannel and maybe suspenders. Um, to represent a modern version of the average person who would have gone out to see Jesus that day when he fed the crowds and who has now come back to share his story with you of that event. You get what I'm doing? I'm going to play a character for the rest of the sermon. Um, The events of this man are reflected, that he's reflecting on, are recorded in John 6. So hear the story of this disciple, this fringe follower in the crowd. We've been hearing many hopeful stories about Jesus. So when we heard he was coming to the Lake of Galilee, we went to check him out. It was a blistering, hot, dry day. But we were so fascinated by the way he spoke with such authority We ended up listening to him almost all the day. We were in the middle of nowhere with no nourishment to help us fight the heat. They found a kid who had brought a typical lunch, some small loaves of barley and a couple pickled sardines to wash them down with. Jesus took that lunch, gave thanks, and fed us all. You heard that earlier. We knew he was something, someone special. We went to make him our king, As our king, he could do anything we wanted him to do. He could feed us, he could heal us, he could lead us to political freedom, take care of any problems that we thought we had. Uh, It's true, many of us had heard about how tired they all were from exhausting missionary trips, about how, and then the added grief of John the Baptist's violent passing, and how they were trying to get away so they could recoup themselves, but... We were afraid this was a once-in-a-lifetime oppor- once opportunity and we weren't going to make allow them to... We weren't going to go home just because they were tired. We wanted to have what we wanted to have. We needed him to serve us, to help us on this day. I know you're not like we were. You'd never condition Jesus' leadership in your life based on whether or not he makes your personal dreams come true. You never follow Jesus only for what you think he will do for you. 
You'd never say, if you do this, Lord, then we'll believe and follow you, right? But we did. I guess that's why when we went to crown him king, he had disappeared into the mountain. He won't let us condition our following him based on whether or not he will do what we want. He was about pleasing God, not people. He refuses to submit to be a king of our own making rather than being a king who remakes us. God refuses to be our God based on our if you do this, then we'll follow. He wants to be our God no matter what happens. It reminds me of when I was a child and my first rabbi talked to me about three men who went and told the enemy king, Our God can surely save us from your fiery furnace, but even if he chooses not to, we will still worship, not worship your gods or your gold statue. Reminds me of one of your old Sunday school songs, Give Me Oil in My Lamp, Keep Me Burning. Remember that song? It's a great theme for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, 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 keep me burning till the break of day. And that's what they had to do, wasn't it? Hmm. I wonder how many, how many of us in that green field that day eventually came to know Jesus as God, even if all their personal and national issues were not resolved the way they were expecting and hoping Jesus would resolve them. Well, I digress. Where was I? Oh, yes, Jesus had disappeared up into the mountain, and we were waiting for him to come back to us, but he never did. And we knew his disciples had been sent away by Jesus to a different town, and some boats from Tiberias had now arrived, and so many of us piled into those boats, thinking if we followed the disciples over to Bethsaida, then we would eventually find Jesus again. When we arrived, we, see, we discovered that Jesus had already arrived ahead of us. That was not possible. He would have had to walk across the lake to do that. We asked how he managed to do, there, do that, but he said it wasn't important. He said instead that we were chasing him down just because he had filled our stomachs. Instead, we ought to be asking about food that endures eternally. So we did. We asked him what work we had to do to earn God's favor. And he said... Have faith in the one that God has sent. But to us, that wasn't even a work. There had to be more to it than that. It flew the fa- in the face of everything we ever believed. It had to be more than just having faith in Jesus alone. Don't you have to add a, a birthright or some kind of work? or uh, At least we had to demand proof before we believed that God loves us in Jesus. So we tested him. We said... Moses gave manna out of heaven to eat, and when the Messiah comes, he will give that heavenly manna again. So, Jesus, what are you going to do to prove that you're the Messiah and you can do that? So we can believe in you. He didn't answer the question. In fact, he tore the question apart. And our misunderstanding of our own history. He said, first of all, it wasn't Moses who gave manna, it was God. And second, manna is not the true bread of heaven. The real bread of heaven gives life to the world. <laughs> well, on the, in, the, in light of the fact that he just fed 5,000 people with the, just a hand, with some kid's lunch, we figured he could give us that heavenly bread, and so we asked him for us, give us this bread. But when he answered, that's when I and many others around me began to wonder just who we were trying to hook up with. He said, I am the bread of life. And he seemed frustrated with our challenges. We kept asking him for the bread, prove, you is the, the, prove the bread, and how is your bread better than manna? And he just says, I am the bread. And it was like he was saying, here I am, right here in front of you. Look at my life, look at my deeds, look at my words. What more could I have lived and done and said than I've already lived and done and said? Can't you see that I'm the one who gives life? We had to ponder that for a minute. He said the bread came out of heaven. He said he was the bread. But he didn't come out of heaven. We knew who his parents were, right? Look that up later. 
if you didn't get that twist. Some of us started muttering under our breath and grumbling. But that didn't slow him down. He went right on after us. We wanted him to prove he was superior to Moses and what Moses did. He said, our ancestors ate the manna, but they still died. But anyone who ate him would live forever. Well, that's a funny twist of phrase, isn't it? Eat him? Now, that's just going a little bit too far. He got carried away. He was claiming too much for himself, demanding too much of us. Let's pause for a fourth grade commercial. In this health conscious day, one cannibal bragged to another about his catch of a trapeze artist. His friend asked, why is that so special? And the first one replied, because it's a very well-balanced meal. (laughs) Another one caught a comedian but complained that it tasted funny. That's an old one. I said fourth grade. Maybe it's second grade. The last one complained about the off taste of some monks that he had caught and boiled, and the head cannibal chef said, you boiled them? Don't you know they're friars? (laughs) Okay, enough commercial. And of course, those outside of Jesus' followers and the early church heard rumors of this kind of talk about eating him and about their love feasts, which was sandwiched, no pun intended, in the middle between the bread and the cup of what you now call communion. It led to a lot of negative gossip about those cannibal Christians. But don't get me wrong, we knew exactly what he meant. In the mystery religions all around us, an animal sacrifice was burned on the altar, and only a small portion was actually consumed in the fire. A portion was then given to the priest, and the rest of it was given back to the worshiper, who then would take it to another part of the temple, and have a feast with his family and friends. Now when the animal was offered up on the altar, they, they believed that the temple's deity, whatever temple, whoever they were worshiping, that temple's deity would enter into the animal. So when the people ate the rest of the animal, they were, in a sense, eating, taking in the presence of their deity, of their God. And when they got up to leave, they would leave God-filled. We understand, understood the symbolism But we were still confused. This man was equating himself with God. But even worse, he was connecting his godhood and kingdom to a sacrifice. And our Messiah was not supposed to rally the troops and lead. He was not supposed to be a sacrifice. He was supposed to rally the troops and lead us in a political deliverance from Rome. So we argued about how he could give us his flesh to eat for an ultimate sacrifice was not in our expectations of a Messiah at all. And Jesus still didn't stop. He just kept piling it on. He not only, we're not only to eat his flesh, we were to drink his blood. Well, that's a no-no. <laughs> in Jewish thinking, the life of the creature is in the blood, and to drink its blood was to be united with its life. So if we consume the blood of a cow, we would be mixing our life with the life of a cow. That's why we don't leave blood in our meat when we eat. And to drink the blood of Christ would be mixing our life with his in an inseparable union. Can you even imagine? We had heard him teach about the vine and branches and how his followers were to, were to abide in him and he in them. And that is the only way to have a fruitful life. But even in the symbolic, if, of the kind of deep connection that he was desiring for those who followed him, it was very difficult to accept. That was really connected top priority kind of thing. And we were still arguing about it when he added, if you can't believe this now, how are you going to believe it when you see me lifted up? And we weren't sure what he was talking about. But we kind of thought it might have something to do with that sacrifice he was saying. And we didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I, with a lot of others, got up off of the grass and headed home. We'd had enough. We wanted a king that was going to powerfully serve us and achieve what our dreams were for us and our world, not one that would sacrifice himself for the world. Of course, all of us who left didn't hear what was said later. We didn't hear Jesus then turn to his 12 and ask if they were going to leave him too. 
I can tell you now because it's recorded. Peter spoke for them and said, To whom else could we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. I wish I'd heard that too because it was true for me too. And you too. I didn't have anywhere to go except back into my own self and my own life and all my activities that that claim they will satisfy me, but they don't. There is nothing eternal in those activities. One of his missionaries, Paul, later wrote, if we have hoped in Christ for this life only, we are in need of pity. We get so caught up in our daily living that we don't have time to live for eternity. How true that was for us who left that day, because that's exactly what we did. We wanted him to be our king in our kingdom. We wanted him to prove in some physical way that he was the Messiah for this life now. We demanded he give us bread that would satisfy us for our whole lives now. Then we argued about his flesh and blood, and we were always arguing in the physical, never in the spiritual. It was always only in this life, this life, this life. Never our spiritual life, never our eternal need. (laughs) Kind of ironic for a religious, God-fearing nation, isn't it? And we know that it isn't that Christ has no interest in this life. Another famous sermon of his, he said not to anxiously worry about those things. He says, God knows you already need them, and they'll be added to you. (laughs) I guess our attention span slipped a bit when he said something about first seeking his kingdom and his righteousness above that. Too late for me. Once I left, refusing to believe Jesus that day, I didn't go back. Yeah, I heard he died. I even heard that he had risen again. Heard that he ascended. Heard about the Holy Spirit. Fascinating stuff. But by now, I had gotten so caught up in the busy duties of my life, I didn't do anything about it. I couldn't seem to create the space or the time to get back to him. It's a dangerous thing to go away when Jesus calls. Maybe when things settle down, when the money is more secure, when I get my act together, so many other things i got to order first in my life. Funny how that never quite seems to happen. But my life isn't over. Maybe I'll get back to him right after I do this and then that. Oh, i got to do this first and then that and then this and that, and that, and this, and that, fade to black. Well, enough of this disciple who refused to believe. In a different time and place, long ago, but not all that long ago, a neighbor, diabetic, alcoholic, under a lot of stress, bad combinations. She was in and out of the hospital, which put her in and out of jobs, which put her constantly out of money. During one of the stints in her hospital, her eldest son, by her words, the good one in the family, was working at a construction site, fell off some scaffolding, and died. One floor beneath her in the hospital. The other son dealt with the grief the same way he handled most of his life, with cocaine. Long story short, after many conversations, she turned to Christ. And her life was turned to great joy in the midst of all of that. She started out with him well. She turned to him for money, turned to him for food, for a job, for the grief process, for health, for emotional stability, for an apartment, for a car, and the list goes on and on and on. And she should have. Where else do you go to get your life in order? And over time, as Christ and Christians worked with her and Her prayers began to be answered and the pieces of her life began to start to fall into place again. She concluded, I've really got myself together. And things slowly began to unravel as she tried to reincorporate her old life into her new one, thinking it would be okay to do now. And I thought maybe she seemed to be a lot like our disciple on the grass that day, like all of them who left that day kept looking to Jesus for this life, but not her spiritual or eternal needs. Only enough to do the work she imagined she had to do to get done what she wanted out of God and out of his people. 
Christ had become nothing more than a resource to dispense temporary benefits to her. And when she began taking even that for granted, and when some of them started dissipating, and she began to return to old patterns and following Christ toward a quality of life, a different life, a new life, began to get harder, she drifted away. And Jesus turns to us and says, you don't want to go away too, do you? And I wonder what our business is in following Jesus. Is it to join his kingdom or get him to join ours? Is he king to decorate our table with fancy plates and silver? Or are we willing to serve him as the main course of our life? Jesus, the bread of life, the essence of what we need to live fully continues to call us in the busyness of life, in the midst of competing priorities, in the dysfunctions of our life, and also in its successes. He gives himself to us to bring us to a full and meaningful life filled with purpose and with satisfaction and an eternal life. Can we answer the call? and give ourselves to him. Let's sing our closing prayer together as a confident commitment and promise that we will give our hearts and lives to him in service and love him most of all. Let's stand as comfortable and sing, Jesus Calls Us. <clears throat> Jesus calls us o'er the tumult And now wherever you go and whatever you do, do everything to the best of your ability as if you are doing it for the Lord, because you are. Bring him glory, praise, and honor by what you say, what you do, and how you live. And Lord, bless the time that we have together now in this picnic. Bless the food and all those who prepared it. And, and just be with us among, and among us and with us and within us as we go through this day together. In Jesus' name, amen.